Hey, profs. Welcome on in. My name's Rob Lightfoot, proud two-time alum of Rick Edelman College of Communication, class of 2000-2001. This is Beyond the Brown and Gold. I'm Jessica Kennedy. I'm the co-host here, also a two-time proud Rowan alum, class of 2008 from the Rick Edelman College of Communication and Creative Arts, and 2015 from the College of Education. Thanks so much for joining us today. Rowan Radio 89.7 WGLS-FM presents Beyond the Brown and Gold, a show that highlights the lives and memories of Glassboro State and Rowan University alumni. Now, here are your hosts, Rob Lightfoot and Jessica Kennedy. On today's show, we have a very special guest, someone I am very excited to share with the entire alumni community. We have Dr. Lillian Lodge, Copenhaver Class of 1962. Say that five times real fast. Oh no, okay. she's got a she's got a lengthy name. She's got it's a lengthy a, name. It's a hearty good name, but it comes with a lot because she's done a lot. Oh my goodness, we were talking in the interview. Wait till you hear all of the things she's done. And as a, a female, just what like a path she's blazed for our future women in communication. So Rob, why don't you tell us a little bit about Lillian? We got to take up get her whole CV up because it's like eighty two pages long. Yeah, let me, let me hear. <laughs> here, here, this is what we have here on her, right? So she, like, like Jess said, she's a 62 alum. She was on the, when she was here, she was an English major, but then she was on the wit. She was on so many of the different pieces of, of, of she's won tons of awards. Oh my goodness. We forgot to even mention in the interview that she was the 2020 Lifetime Service Award recipient. From, yeah, I think you just did it now. Yeah. So I'm going to put it out there because we didn't talk about it, unfortunately. But And then, and then she's made it, uh, she's obviously very connected to the university philanthropically, but also through her Center for the Advancement of Women in Communication, which we're now a proud affiliate of. Yes. She is Dean Emeritus and Professor Emeritus for the School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Florida International University. And she's also the executive director for the Center for the Advancement of Women in Communication at Florida International University. She was with FIU from their humble beginnings from really day one or two or something she was saying in the interview. And she's seen it grow and they're celebrating their 50th year. So she has a rich career history to share with you all. And we're really jazzed uh, that she was able to join us all the way from the Sunshine State. So all the way from the Sunshine State, we have a dear friend of the university, Dr. Lillian Lodge, Copenhaver. Lillian, thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to be here. And you have this fabulous FIU background that says the future is female behind you, which I love. And FIU stands for? Florida International University, which is here in Miami. And Lillian, how long have you been with FIU? Well, actually, this year marks an anniversary for me. I have been at FIU 50 years. Wow. Congratulations. I have literally grown up with FIU. I started at FIU when the university was only nine months old and it literally opened so I am considered one of the founders of the university because I came in FIU's first year. Um, and so and FIU is 50 years old this year. So it's very, very cool. That is very cool. You're a part of the rich history of the institution. So we're going to go back to before your FIU time, back to your time. And uh, Lily and I have quite a few things in common. So we know each other pretty well because we grew up in the, the same area. So Lily, and why don't you tell our guests today where you grew up and how you found out about Glassboro State? Well, I grew up in at the Jersey Shore, Point Pleasant. I uh, went to Point Pleasant Beach High School. And I will say that the Jersey Shore is just a wonderful place to grow up all of the beaches and everything that you have that's fun there. I, I chose Glassboro, gosh, I think when I was a freshman in high school, because I just knew that was where I wanted to go. I loved the location. I loved the look of the campus. And and so all through high school, I, I was I was determined that's where I was going to go. So, um, and I did. I will tell you that it's one of the best experiences I ever had in my life. Uh, it was a wonderful four years that I spent there. I lived on campus, of course, but commuted home weekends. And uh, the funny thing was that I I was the one with the carpool. So we had a lot of folks from the shore, from the Point Pleasant, Manasquan area, who would ride home back and forth with me on the weekends to go home. Uh, They would go to their houses and then they'd come and meet me. And then we'd drive back Sunday night back to campus. So it was fun. Now, did you have anybody of your friends that were coming to Glassboro? Like, how did you find out? Because there was no Google back then. We weren't binging anything or Google or anything back then. How did you, how'd you find out about the school? You know, I I think it was just through the counselors. It wasn't that I knew anybody who went there. That definitely wasn't it. I think it was just some of the counselors. 
And then there were a number of us who from the high school went there. So we kind of, you know, uh, had a little little group. But uh, and I and I always knew I was going to be a teacher, even when I was in eighth grade. That was something I was going to do. It was uh, in my uh, career plan. I enjoyed uh, doing that kind of thing. And so, you know, the choices were, were a few in those days. And moving to Trenton did not sound like the most exciting thing <laughs> in the world. Um, and it just seemed like Glassboro was the place to go. So that was it. And, you know, kind of easy from the Jersey Shore. I agree. So I also grew up close to probably about 10 minutes from where Lillian's childhood home is. And I agree, sometimes we went home a lot on the weekends because there's so much great stuff at the Jersey Shore. You're so used to being close to the beach and all these fabulous restaurants. So Glassboro, I know for me, when I came here, I didn't even know how to say Gloucester County. I was like, Gloucester, where at, you know, where am I? I? I loved it here, but couldn't quite pinpoint where we were. So what did you think when you got here? Did you immediately fall in love with it? Oh, absolutely. And you have to remember when I was there, in, starting in 1958, there was College Hall and a very few buildings around the quad. And that was it. Cross 322 was, you know, peach and apple orchards. So as an aside, on the weekends when we go home, I would pull up slowly by the other side of the road and my passengers would run out and grab some apples or whatever was, you know, ripe at the time, put them in the car, we'd zip off and then we'd be eating fruit all the way home. It was a beautiful little campus at that time. And of course, College Hall with the dome and everything, and it was College Hall in those days, uh, with the dome and everything was just magnificent looking, just a beautiful looking campus. So I loved it. And and I, my, my friends did too. It was just a nice place to be. It's still a great like postcard picture. Yeah. I Col- like the, the, the Bunce Green mm-hmm. and that side of Absolutely. campus, just so gorgeous like to have. They, we've had our um, engagement photos taken on Bunce Green, maternity photos. So many profs, sweethearts, take their pictures yes. on Bunce Green because it's just so iconic. We love that building. So what is uh, you, while, while you were here on campus, any, what were some of the uh, activities you were involved with? Well, I, I immediately got involved with journalism in my freshman year because I had been involved with it in, uh, in high school. Uh, when I was in high school, I wrote a, a weekly column for our local newspaper on things that were happening at Point Pleasant Beach High School. So uh, I was really into writing and and all of that. So I immediately got involved with the WIP and um, stayed involved with it all four years and became a senior editor in my senior year uh, and just kind of went up the ladder. So um, that was my main uh, area of uh, involvement. But I was part of Kappa Delta Pi. And we did a lot of service through that organization. And but then we sponsored a what we call New Jersey Collegiate Press Day on, on campus one time and brought people from all over the state to our campus um, to have a journalism uh, activity. So we really did a lot of things in journalism, which, of course, that's what I went on to do and am still doing these days. So, Lillian, tell us what it was like, the social environment when you were here on campus? Because I always think our listeners might like to hear um, when we bring our golden profs back on campus. So our graduates of 50 or more Mm -hmm. years ago, we get to hear so many cool stories about who was allowed in dorms and when and what you were allowed to wear and not allowed to wear. And I think that historical context of the social piece is kind of neat. So can you tell us a little bit about what that was like on campus then? Well, from the very first day we arrived, we, we had little hats called dinks that we had to wear as freshmen. And um, you had to, and uh, listen, women didn't wear slacks in those days. I mean, it was skirts and it was bobby socks. um, And that was, you know, kind of the the uniform of the day, let's say. Um, But as far as the social life was concerned, I don't think there were any more than about 1500 students on campus in those days. We were really very small. So you really got to know a lot of folks, uh, which was lovely. The student center was the the place to be, which is it's no longer the student center. But in in those days, that's where your your social life was. You you hung out there and you uh, got together with with friends and did activities and hang hung out in the cafeteria. So it was it was just an opportunity really to get to know a lot of people because we were small and it was very personal. It was a very personal kind of an environment. But we also um, our first year, we had to live off campus as freshmen. They didn't have enough dorm rooms and the dorms were segregated, you know, male and female, and there weren't enough dorm rooms. So we lived off campus, which made us 
which forced us into trying to connect with people on campus as freshmen. And the way I did it and some of my friends did was we got involved like with the newspaper. So you were there evenings working in, in the, the student center. Uh, you were working on the paper, you know, and writing and with, with your little group, which was, of course, across all of the different classes. So um, our social life or my social life really was kind of around journalism activities and, and with the students. And the other thing that uh, because of my interest in, in journalism and in writing, I got involved with was the student handbook. It's called The Acorn and uh, became the editor of that. And then eventually became, we had a Bureau of Student Publications. And I don't know if that still exists to this day, but it was representatives of all the student media at the time, the, the yearbook uh, included. Uh, I became president of that organization. So got to know people working on all of the student media uh, that were there at the time. So that became became the social realm for me and for colleagues who were who were really, really interested in that area. And was there a professor or a mentor you had while you were here that kind of helped shape your experiences at Glassboro State? Yeah, it was George Reinfeld. He was the uh, advisor to the WIT and uh, the the journalism teacher at that time, the only journalism teacher. And there weren't there weren't many journalism courses. I think there were only two or three that were taught. So there wasn't a major or minor or anything like that. So you took those courses and then you worked, uh, you know, on the student media. And George was always there to work with us. So he put in the late nights just like we put in the late nights. So he was he was really the mentor to all of us. I always forget that you worked in Central Jersey. So all of these little snippets of Point Pleasant and Brick Township, like you know, you know those. Places. I do know those, but I also have a question for Lillian. Is there such a thing as Central New Jersey? Because to me, it's North and South. I mean, I don't know that <laughs> That's Central because Jersey you're exists. You're not from there. I, I used to tell people because I used to work in the sort of brick area, and I told people I'm going to North Jersey. And they were well, like, from here it's from north, here it's north, but it's Jersey. not. It's not North Jersey. And they told me it's not pork roll. It's Taylor ham. I don't know what it is. Uh, we could do that. I don't now. know. I call it pork roll. But Lillian, there's a Central Jersey, right? There is a Central Jersey, particularly if you <laughs> live there, because we weren't North Jersey. Actually, I was born in in Linden, so that was North Jersey. But when I was ten, eleven, we moved down to the shore, and then I grew up there. But we were the shore. We Lillian's the house was five minutes from oh, that's fun. Point Pleasant Beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, a few years ago, Lillian was on campus, and I had the pleasure of taking Lillian back to uh, her childhood home, and we kind of ventured all about Point Pleasant and Bayhead, and she introduced me to this incredible bakery, Muller's, which is um, in, that's Bayhead, right? Right, Lillian? Right. It, Rob, it was crazy because when I was in high school, I used to work at this bakery called Christina's Bakery, which was in the, the Ramtown section of Howell, which people who were from my area would know what that meant. And it was like the duplicate of that bakery. Like, like I think the recipes must have been shared amongst the bakeries because it's like I went there with Lillian and I like smelt and and looked at everything and I was like, Lillian, it's like you brought me home. <laughs> like, because like, it was just like a piece of my, my youth growing up that like that just walking into a bakery. It was so, that day was so fun. We had such a good time. And we really did. And, and I'm thankful to you for being willing to drive us over to the shore, but it was a fun part of the day. Absolutely. I enjoyed it tremendously. So just got and kind of got the feels when she went to the bakery. Do you get the feels when you come back to campus and get to see everything that's going on here in Glassboro now, the development that's taking place? Oh, it's amazing. Uh, and I have not been back. I will tell you, the first time I went back was for my 40th reunion. So you can imagine from when I graduated in, in 62 to when we went back for our 40th reunion, what a difference there was. I mean, it was like, whoa, <laughs> uh, coming out, you know, into another world because uh, the 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 apple orchards and peach orchards were yeah. gone. I I lived in uh, in my sophomore year. I lived in Linden and and, and also actually in Hollybush, and that's a whole other story, which Jess knows. And then my junior senior year, I uh, I lived in Laurel. Well, that all changed. You know, Linden was no longer, I guess, a dorm, right? Linden's and, gone. Like, yeah, Linden's gone now. Even it's a part. Linden uh, is they paved paradise and they put up a parking <laughs> lot on. Road. Really? Very good reference. I mean, yeah, there's a that's a parking lot now, Linden. Wow. Well, that was I, the last time I was back. When, I'm trying to remember four years ago, five years ago. So, Lillian, what brought you out to Florida? How did you get there? After I taught at Brick for a while at, at the high school level, uh, the first community college 
uh, in New Jersey open, it was Ocean County College in Tom's River. Some of the folks from Brick went over there and then they recruited me to go over to Ocean County College as well. So I went over there to start the journalism program. I loved starting things and to start the student newspaper and spent four years there. And then at the time, a friend of mine who was teaching at Miami-Dade College, um, which was also a community college at the time, and I was I got involved nationally in the Community College Journalism Association. It was an organization. And that's how I met Mario Garcia through that. And uh, he said, we have, we have an opening for a yearbook advisor and a journalism teacher with me. Uh, and why don't you come down? And um, I had met the man who would become my husband at the time. And he had gone to University of Miami for his undergraduate degree. And he always wanted to go to Florida. So it was kind of circumstances. Um, they offered me the job at Miami-Dade. So I thought, you know, it was time to look for maybe some upward mobility that, you know, I could look at a future where I might be able to become whatever, you know, at that point in time. So uh, in 71, I, I went to Miami-Dade and then in 72, FIU opened. So I watched it in its early days and I thought, oh, this would be amazing if I could get a job at FIU. And then, uh, so I just sent my resume over because they were hiring, they were hiring everybody because it was a brand new university. Sent my resume over and they called me for an interview and hired me um, the, next, the following year um, as the first director of student activities for FIU. Um, and because of my journalism background, because I could do student media, I needed to start the yearbook, the newspaper, <laughs> the radio station. You, they you were name probably it. underpaying you. Oh, they, they definitely were. And every student activity, including student government, and you know what a student government is, trying to start one up, write a constitution. And I was that, that advisor. So I had to start everything. And uh, interestingly, one of the first parts of my job uh, at FIU was hiring entertainment to come on campus. At the time, we only had one building. That was how the university started. So I hired a group called the Miami Sound Machine. Well, the Miami Sound Machine became Gloria Stefan and her group. So wow. I knew Gloria when she was a kid. We hired her and her, well, her husband at the time, she was part of the band. And they came and entertained at FIU. So it was kind of fun, to say the least. We'll have more with Beyond the Brown and Gold when we return. Welcome back to Beyond the Brown and Gold. And Lillian, we've mentioned the Center for Advancement of Women in Communication. Can you talk about what the mission is, the goal of the organization? Sure. Um, let me just say that this is our 10th anniversary year this year. So we are really, really excited. Uh, we, we were founded in 2013. Our mission statement is to empower young women in all the fields of communication in order to develop visionaries and leaders who can make a difference in their communities and in their professions. So we are building an army of women empowered for the future. What we are doing for the past, and what have, we have been doing for the past 10 years is putting on programs. Um, we do uh, monthly virtual workshops. They're virtual now. They were in person prior to the pandemic, but we found that now with our our satellite centers, and we now have three satellite centers. Rowan was the very first. Uh, we have also have one at Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri, which is the second oldest women's college in the United States, and a third at Marymount University, which is in Arlington, Virginia. And we will be opening another uh, satellite center at California State University, Fullerton, uh, in the fall. So now we're doing the workshops virtually because with all of our satellite centers, we can bring together students and folks across the country. So through virtual workshops now, but in-person workshops prior to the pandemic, we did some statistical research on the reach of our programs that we've reached 28,000 young women mm. in the 10 years that we've been doing these workshops. We do a national conference. We've done six of them. Our sixth was this year. Uh, we do uh, workshops uh, on on topics, we did a leadership fellows workshop, a mentorship program where we it was one year long and we matched up uh, a young woman working in the field, already working in the field with a professional and in, in a mentorship program. We did that for three years. Um, we also do a program in the summer with uh, young PhD faculty who've just gotten their PhDs and have started teaching journalism and mass communication at colleges and universities across the country. 
and this year was our 10th anniversary of that that one summer workshop. Uh, we do it in conjunction with the annual convention of the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication, and their conference moves around the country. So um, this coming year, it's in Washington, D.C., and we will do our 11th workshop. Uh, it's a six-hour event where we bring together, uh, and they have to apply for the program, but it's new young PhDs, assistant professors who are just starting on the tenure track, wanting to move up the ladder to maybe to become a director or a chair or a dean someday, and we train them. We bring in senior deans and directors uh, to talk to them. We do roundtables and everything when we have them together, um, and we've had nearly 350 young women faculty go through that program in the 10 years we've done it. Uh, from about 150 different colleges and universities, even internationally. We've had folks from Australia and Sweden and the Dominican Republic and you name it, Chile, uh, you name it. We've had faculty members from all of those countries and states and colleges and universities. So what we, what we try to do is to, um, I think you're all well aware that half of the population, more than half the population of this country is female. And yet only one third of the positions in media and in communications uh, are filled by women. So our job is to try to do leadership training to empower young women to be able to move up that ladder and become the leaders in the communications professions of tomorrow. And that's what we try to do. We work with, with them in high school. Uh, we do programs bring it, where we bring high school kids to campus. We work with them through boot camps in which Rowan participates uh, in the boot camp, uh, graduating seniors. We work with them as alumni and we work with them in the community. So we have kind of a full range of programs that we put on throughout the year. So we're pretty proud of the work we've done. And there's no other center like ours in the country. We're unique because we do training and programs for both academics as well as professionals, women. Can you think of any <laughs> personal experiences you've had as a female communicator that might have inspired the creation of a center like this? Oh, definitely. <laughs> in, in so many instances, I was the uh, only woman in the room in a journalistic kind of setting. After, when I started teaching, I had uh, become a member of this group I had mentioned, the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communication, and got involved with them. And I went to their conferences and I was literally one of the few women there and there were, you know, a thousand, 1500 people going to the conference and there were not many women there. Uh, and uh, I thought to myself, goodness, you know, this is, um, this is very strange. And so I thought we need to facilitate more women getting involved in journalism education. Um, and then um, when I moved to Miami, uh, I got involved with the Society of Professional Journalists which had a Greater Miami chapter, became a member of that. I had originally been inducted into the society as one of the very first women they ever took in because it was a man's group. Um, and they decided in 1970 to induct some women. And I was inducted in 1970, that was one of the first women into the New Jersey chapter. So I joined the chapter when I got down here, uh, wound up becoming its president, but realized that there were no women members. There were it was one other woman who recruited me to the chapter. So I, I was in so many instances like this where I was the first woman something in the field of journalism. And it was very difficult because when I was looking to build our Greater Miami chapter of SPJ down here, I went around and met with some of the men who had been past chapter presidents because it was an old chapter. It had been around for quite a while and wanted to recruit them to come back. And the answer I got was, Oh, when they let women in, it just changed the whole tenor. So uh, I decided that I needed to, I didn't want other women to have to be subjected to things like that. You know, in my work in the School of Journalism, we tried to facilitate doing things for young women. And then also through the center, which is our main focus now, is to try to um, facilitate young women becoming leaders in the field of communications. You and I have also talked about this group of women that you sometimes lunch with and um, this history of that. So I kind of think that that's a, a neat little thing. Can you tell, can you tell Rob because I know about it, but can you tell Rob about this group? <laughs> yes, it's called the Sisterhood. Uh, about, I want to say 12 years or so ago. 
Do we have we to have, swear people, uh, by the way, not to like, yeah. give, give the secret out? Yeah, well, she's saying it on, on a, live on a show. Okay, so, so yeah, yeah. Gonna, <laughs> I just want to make fact, sure. We, we've had our, our current president there. If you tried to, to become a member of the sisterhood, we wouldn't let him. <laughs> He, he uh, jumped into one of our dinner meetings one time, said, could he come? <laughs> there were a few of us who were women deans at the time. And so we talked about, we really ought to have some of the women leaders at the university have an opportunity to get together to talk uh, about women in leadership, et cetera. A colleague of mine, she was the dean of nursing at the time, made it happen. She was kind of the facilitator. And it was women who were deans, vice presidents, uh, assistant VPs, you know, of that level. And we had a group of about 12 women, and we started getting together bi-monthly, let's say, at one another's house. We just kind of moved around South Florida, depending upon who you know would, would host the next get-together. It was kind of a dinner or a potluck or whatever it may be, but we could talk about issues as they related to women within the university, um, and also about just um, mentoring each other, you know, uh, helping younger women along. Uh, advising them on various kinds of things. And it was just a really good opportunity. So um, and the sisterhood still exists. And we, in the core of us, um, there are six of us and we still get together every couple of months. Um, in fact, we have a, an event coming up in, in, on March the 2nd um, where one of, one of our uh, members, she was the Dean of the uh, College of Business Administration, since retired and moved out of state, but she's going to be in town. So we're using that excuse to get the sisterhood together and uh, with her because we haven't seen her in a while. But we still facilitate things happening. And one of the members of our group went on to become the chancellor at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. And uh, others have become, you know, moved on to other positions. But we, uh, another one is the president of Marymount University. But there's still that core group, but we still get together. And even though some of them moved away, they come to Miami. My, it seems Miami is always home. But it's been really good because women need to do that kind of thing to share, uh, to share advice, to um, help younger women coming up who, you know, help them up the ladder. And we found that that's really been uh, very helpful and, and a good model. I think you, you could have that model at any place. I love her. Can I? <laughs> Can that be how we end? Can we end? You can just it say that. Is? Just say that I love her. Yeah, I love it. Well, I think she's super cool. I am so grateful for all that she's done for Rowan and continues to do on the regular. So we hope that you had a blast listening to Lillian and you were inspired. And I think I'm gonna have to end it by saying the future is female, Rob. You've been listening to Beyond the Brown and Gold on Rowan Radio 89.7 WGLS-FM. You can find more episodes on your favorite podcasting platforms by searching for Beyond the Brown and Gold or Rowan Radio On Demand.